Good morning. My name is Steve Weldon. I'm from University Advancement, and I'm delighted that um, all of you students can join us today. Um, these are three outstanding attorneys with diverse practices, different locations. You're going to get a really wide range of experience and perspective, and I'm really delighted to welcome them today. I also wanted to welcome Provost Faye Crosby, uh, Professor John DeZikas, and Dina Robertson, who's played such a role with so many of you here at the campus. I wanted to give some brief files, if I may, just to start off, and then we'll get right into the heart of the program because there's a lot to cover. We're going to try to have about five or ten minutes at the end for initial questions, and then you're all invited over to the Provost's house at Cowell for pizza, lunch, soda, and to engage the attorneys directly in one-on-one -on -one conversations, which we have found in the past is really valuable. Terry Cuff is a 1971 graduate, Cal College graduate in economics. He's a partner with the Los Angeles office of a large national law firm specializing in solving federal tax problems. This is one of Terry's typical pithy, very short introductions. And I'm taking the personal liberty of adding that the chancellor in the university is deeply appreciative to Terry for his initiative in, and leadership in pivotally bringing alumni reunions back to this campus and taking a major role in organizing those for the university. It's a big deal for us and we're very, very appreciative. Thank you, Paul Hall is a 1972 Merrill College graduate in politics with highest honors and college honors. He is a partner with DLA Piper, a large national and international law firm based in San Francisco. Paul is the parent of UCSC student Lauren Hall, a trustee of the UC Santa Cruz Foundation, formerly a regent of the University of California, and formerly president of the UCSC Alumni Association. He attended law school at Yale and Berkeley, graduating from UC Berkeley Law School in 1975. Paul has been in private law firm practice since his graduation from law school. He is a trial lawyer for business cases, mainly defending companies in class actions and other complex commercial litigation involving financial institutions, consumer and labor issues. Donna Reynolds is a California State University Chico 1982 graduate majoring in German. She is currently in-house counsel for the family business located in Woodbridge, California. Donna is the parent of UCSC student Zachary Reynolds and a UCSC parent committee member. Donna specialized in commercial litig litigation after graduating from McGeorge Law School thereafter returning to teach legal research, writing, and analysis. Her current in-house in counsel work involves a winery, farming, packing, shipping entities, and residential and commercial development projects. She is also outside counsel to several of those entities on issues involving transactional law, banking law, employment law, corporate governance, and regulatory compliance. In, in addition, Donna is a member of the California State Bar Agribusiness Committee. With those introductions, I want to thank our presenters and start off with Paul. Thank you all for coming today. I want to talk just a couple of minutes about an overview. Um, one hears a lot about the practice of law. Um, exciting, you see it on TV. People think you make a lot of money in the practice of law. Uh, and or people think that if you don't know what else to do after college, go to law school because it is a useful thing to prepare you for virtually anything else. Um, I would suggest that those motivations are wrong. Uh, I think that with law or any other career, you ought to find what you love and do it. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about the social prestige. Don't worry about what TV says about it. Find a profession or any kind of career that fits you. And there is no one size fits all of what is good or what ranks high on the food chain. It all is a matter of individual fit. Uh, what fits you intellectually? Does your head go in a math science way? Does it go in an artistic way? Does it go in an argumentative verbal way? Uh, those kind of fits are pretty basic. Uh, then within a given profession, such as law or medicine, anything like that, there are vast differences in subspecialties, many of which have significant emotional and family life implications uh, for what it's like to lead that life. Find out those things. There's no right or wrong. There's no one size fits all. But find out what fits for you. Because you know, when you, when you leave here, 
you're going to be working for about 40 years. 40 years is a really long time to do something that you don't like. <laughs> so find what fits for you, what works for you morally, emotionally, and intellectually, uh, and then pursue that path. Um, within the practice of law, there are uh, huge variations in what the different subspecialties are like. Uh, you're going to hear from a pretty broad range of people today. Um, Donna, who, who we'll hear from first, uh, in many ways has the broadest gauge practice, um, and, and that gives you one snapshot. Uh, Terry has a very sophisticated and intellectually esoteric tax practice. I got a C in tax in law school, so uh, I'm very impressed by what Terry can do. Uh, and I'm a trial lawyer uh, working mainly in complex uh, business cases. Um, so with that overview, let's start off with Donna. Good morning. I don't have a typical day, so I'm going to tell you about yesterday. I woke up, I looked at my cell phone, and I had a text message from the general manager of our packing house. Are you up? Can you call me? Can you call me now? Can I call you? <laughs> so it is the most wonderful time of the year for us. Cherry season has just started, and it's wild. And we sell not only domestically, but we sell to Japan, Korea, Australia, and China, which is a very exciting brand new market. So that call was for me to go to a meeting first thing in the morning, and they were putting together this deal. And it's one of my favorite things to do as an attorney. So I'm sitting in, I'm listening to the details. Who's going to do what? How much are we going to sell it for? What's our percentage? I've got to get all that down because I'm going to write it up. And then it's my turn, and I ask the questions to get the information I need. Then the other party side, you know, not our guys, they leave, and then I ask my guys, okay, let's talk about the monsters in the closet. Tell me every way this can go wrong so that I can anticipate it and minimize our risk. I don't have, I am my staff, I'm my accountant, it's just me. So I went home to my home office, drafted up this real short contract, took it into our office, asked a couple questions. I didn't know if hauling was the same as shipping, things like that, learning all the time. Took care of that. Then we have a commercial development that actually is developing, which is exciting in this economy. And we had spent a couple weeks negotiating uh, bank terms for a uh, loan modification. So I looked at that final document to make sure the terms were as we agreed. And they were, sometimes they're not. So you have to check that, so that was okay. Then the next thing is we were having a meeting for the winery, a lunch meeting. If you're wondering if it's fun to work for a winery, oh yeah, it really is. <laughs> there, was, there was wine at the lunch meeting. And I have that dual hat. I'm there as an owner, but I'm also there reporting on our financing. I know all our different loans and all the details. And we have some litigation going. And I used to litigate. I can't now because I'm just that one person and your firm would bury me very quickly. Um, and so I work with our outside counsel, and that's a lot of fun. Came back to the office, ate a bunch of raw fava beans, because we're packing those now. It's a good place to work. There's always all kinds of fruit and food and that type of thing. And my surprise was that we are going to start signing people up today when I thought we were doing it on May 15th and start packing tomorrow. So on the regulatory side, I needed to make sure that we had all the documents our employees have to fill out and that we had all our notices up in the packing shed and that type of thing. I'm really dressed up today. I'm usually jeans and uh, t-shirt because you might find me in an orchard or a vineyard, definitely in our packing house. So I get dirty sometimes. Um, driving up here last night on 17, I got a call from our GM. And uh, he and I talked about cherry quality. How does the crop look this year? And I'm pleased to report that we topped it off at Woodstocks, met uh, my son there, and he and his roommates, and uh, we won trivia night. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my day. I'm the representative of the dismal science. <laughs> Everybody hates tax. Was the reason you got to see in the course. If you'd like tax, you would have done better. Uh, but I will tell you, if you get nothing else from this session, one of the things that you certainly should get is 
law cuts across absolutely everything in human endeavor. And quite frankly, there probably is no field which mirrors that any more than taxation. Practically, anything that you do in business and in family life ends up having tax implications. So it may seem like the dismal science, but I must say, in practicing tax law, I've just gotten into just, my, my practice has just crossed all sorts of businesses, all sorts of activity, and all sorts of actually quite interesting and exciting people. I'm going to go through three phases of my career. I, I think I have about five minutes to summarize 34 years. Uh, started out my first year with a firm that was doing principally entertainment tax. In the course of that, as a first-year associate in tax, not very unusual, doing a lot of research, doing a certain amount of uh, drafting of documentation, partnerships, public offerings, working for a clientele that looked like the listing of the Academy Awards, quite frankly. I mean, everyday names, but my wife told me not to drop names, so I won't. <laughs> that was the first year. Unfortunately, and something to watch out for is I was working for someone who is an absolute ogre, one of the most difficult people in the world to work for. Decided to go to NYU for an advanced degree in taxation, came back, and since 1979, I've been at my present firm. Um, again, has exposed me to all sorts of things. Uh, in my mature practice, got involved in acquisitions, uh, I mean, it wasn't unusual. There were days that I'd get a phone call, be in New York this afternoon, and I'd come back three, four weeks later. I mean, just anything like that can happen. Was involved in bringing cable television to the United States when that was first developing. Did lots of cable television work, lots of real estate work, securities work, other things like that. A second aspect of the practice is I got to do lots of writing and got to do lots of lecturing end up lecturing pretty much across the country. Um, now I'm in kind of a, 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 a real later phase of uh, my career. Um, end up again doing lots of lecturing, have taught at uh, USC and UCLA. Um, now I find I'm more involved in, in trying to encourage Treasury to make beneficial tax policy decisions. So I've gotten involved quite a bit in tax policy with the Department of Treasury and the IRS and um, all sorts of things like that. But again, if, if, if anything else I've seen, tax can mean anything and practicing law can get you involved in anything. Just real quick, some of the things that I see in my particular firm is I've got lots of people, we have lots of people that are doing music work representing entertainers, record companies. We've got many people that are heavily involved in motion picture finance, representing entertainers. I have one partner who does nothing but Broadway plays. It can be terrible when Spider-Man doesn't work. Um, I, have, I have 30 partners that are doing new media. I don't have the slightest idea what those guys do, but your guess is as good as mine. And of course, we have copyright, trademark, securities, and litigation lawyers. Paul? Thanks, Terry. Well, contrary to Terry's expectation that I didn't like tax, I actually did. <laughs> I made a huge mistake, which I'll pass on as a life lesson. Stayed up too late the night before the exam, studied way too hard. The next morning, got all hopped up on too much Pete's coffee. I went into that exam, I was like Alvin and the three chipmunks. <laughs> So the life lesson is, it's more important to be happy and well-rested than to do that last two hours of study. Yeah. <laughs> <Good> <laughs> have advice. a beer the night before I get a good night's sleep. <laughs> so I want to pick up on something that Donna said, that it's her job to anticipate risk. That's a whole lot of what lawyers do, spread across every single specialty. Our jobs, whether we're litigators, uh, a general counsel working for a company, a highly specialized niche practice. Our job is to know the law and advise clients how to obey the law and when they have messed up, advise them how best to get out of a jam and how to mitigate risk. Our job is to know the law, advise compliance, anticipate risk, and achieve best solutions for clients. 
And that's really what all lawyers do all the time, even though we may do it through different modalities. Um, in, what I like best about the practice of law is the intellectual challenge. It's always new. It's never cookie cutter. As a trial lawyer, what I do is, um, if you're Don or Terry, you're making the facts. You're doing a deal. You have a chance to do it right as it's going along. Okay? We try. <laughs> trial lawyers are, on the contrary, more like the pathologists of the law. Uh, typically, people don't get sued unless they have messed up to some degree or another. So the facts are already set when they come to me. So it's my job, and here, here's where it becomes intellectually fun and why I say do what you like to do, what makes you happy and turns you on. It's my job to figure out the facts, apply a legal construct to those facts and figure out what is their legal significance, and then figure out how best to represent my client consistent with truthful argument of the facts and consistent with fair-minded application of the law. Within those parameters, you then get two sides, each arguing their case for their client, trying the best they can uh, to get a good result for their client. And in that sense, what I really like being, about being a trial lawyer is I'm wearing about four different hats. Partly, I'm an historian. I have to figure out what happened and figure out why. What happened and why? Who done it? Um, and often you're making inferences, often you're making educated guesses about motives and what must have happened and where to look for that next thing. Then, when you put on a trial, you're like a playwright, right? You got all these facts, you're given the facts, you can't make them up. But you assemble them in a way that is most persuasive to your client. In effect, you get to be the playwright writing the script. Then, you are also the director of the play except instead of trained professional actors, you're dealing with regular human beings with greater degrees uh, of intellectual acuity, emotional stability, and ability to remember what the heck happened. And it's your job to present that uh, honestly and persuasively to the extent that your human material allows that. It can be challenging. Uh, and then another hat that we all wear all the time is being a counselor and a mediator. Um, most cases that go to court wind up settling rather than going to trial. Uh, so in that sense, if you, if you think of what you know, a marriage counselor does, um, lawyers do a whole lot of that because it's, it's our job, if we can, to bring opposing parties together because usually a, a quick, sensible business solution beats the heck out of the parties throwing spears at each other for five or ten years in court. Um, the, the, the stuff that you read about in, in the headlines in the newspaper, all of those cases, they may be intellectually interesting, but they are train wrecks for the parties who are involved in them because it just is almost never in anyone's personal or business interest uh, to be in a long, drawn-out, hyper-complicated case that is on the front page of the newspaper. So um, that's what I like about it. It's, I've been doing it um, over 35 years now, and uh, it's always interesting, it's always exciting, it's always new. Uh, it's always difficult. Uh, it brings with it some stresses and strains. Um, the the, uh, the size of cases um, kind of have their own life. They don't come in nice little bite-sized packages. So it's a very different lifestyle than, say, if you're a physician seeing patients on 20-minute intervals in office visits and you can kind of control how many patients you see in a day or a week. Um, all of us have that aspect of our lives. If we've got a problem, maybe it takes one or two hours to solve the problem, or maybe it's just this horrendous thing that winds up taking 2,000 hours to solve, and you don't really know at the beginning, and you just got to jump into it and handle the matter for your client. And the last thing that I would mention about the practice is we work for clients, and that brings with it a legal responsibility and a fiduciary responsibility, but also very strongly a moral responsibility. You've got, um, you've got real people depending on you to do the very best job that you can for them. And, and that involves um, giving it 110% all the time. Um, uh, and and I, th I think that's also 
uh, a rewarding thing to, to know that what you do matters and, and people are counting on you. So that's what it's like in my life. Um, so we're, we've, we're going to move now from presentations about individual practices to uh, the more general topic uh, concerning the uh, importance and perspective uh, of a legal education. And we're going to kind of have a roundtable discussion, but um, I would really encourage uh, folks in the audience to, to pipe up with questions and, and become part of the mix. Uh, after all, what this university is best at uh, is uh, participatory learning. Uh, so, uh, Terry or Donna, do you want to lead off with uh, what you think the uh, significance of a legal education is in law and life? Tough to be a lawyer without it. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I guess the, I mean, I found legal education absolutely stimulating. I mean, it, it's sort of, it's the perfect graduate school for after UCSC. And, and, and by the way, I, I, and I think this is a common experience, UCSC was great for preparing me for, for law school. Um, but again, it, very challenging intellectually, very good in learning how to reason, and in many ways very bad for training you for the day-to-day -day life as a lawyer. There is a big gap between what you learn during your three years in legal education and what most lawyers do on a day-by-day -day basis. And sort of the typical pattern is you go from that to what effectively is an apprentice program with, in some cases, a big law firm, some cases, medium-sized, some cases, a small law firm. Very few people, I find, very few people in my class hung out their shingle after uh, law school. Um, yeah, I'll pick up on that apprenticeship part. Um, if you go into medicine, there is a formal apprenticeship program. Uh, they call it internship and residency. And these days, a lot of doctors specialize and will then get a postdoctoral fellowship. Um, doctors then so have, they have a formal apprenticeship program, and they get horribly exploited and paid slave wages while they're working, you know, 80 to 100 hours a week um, for those years of training. Um, Lawyers have a similar apprenticeship program, but and somewhat uh, similar hours. <laughs> yeah, but the, hour, the hours are not the hours are not as bad as the doctor hours, and the pay is better. Uh, the, Ninety hours a week. <laughs> the uh, so so as as Terry uh, rightly said, uh, most people coming out of law school will join a relatively larger legal organization. Uh, it might be a government law job working for a district attorney's or public defender's office. Uh, it might be working for a government agency. It might be working for a large law firm. Um, and you come in uh, on the bottom of the food chain in that organization. And, uh, and it really is an apprenticeship. And over your first four, six, eight years, uh, there's, a, there's a very definite rotation of uh, getting your ticket punch, doing a whole lot of different tasks, learning how to do different things. Um, and as your personal capability and experience uh, increases, uh, you rise up and you get uh, more individual responsibility. So you often start off doing a whole lot of research and writing on intellectually difficult things, which is not that different than uh, doing a serious paper uh, in college. Um, and then as you progress, you'll get um, either client facing and client counseling face-to-face -face responsibilities or you'll uh, be in court um, or you'll be uh, a direct advisor to, to clients, to government agencies, that kind of stuff. Um, and it's a process of incremental building layers of experience. Um, and so depending upon the specialty and depending upon uh, how well the individual clicks into it, um, you know, you'll really notice um, quantum leaps. Uh, they happen subtly and they don't happen on exactly the same schedule for everybody. So like the way you know, little kids develop differently. They walk at different ages and they talk at different ages, but everybody goes through these quantum leaps. And, and the same thing with lawyers. So, you know, in your two and four and six and eight year progression, you'll really notice uh, how you're growing. And at some point, you know, around the sixth or eighth year, you're starting to feel pretty darn good about your well-rounded ability to do most things that you're called upon to do. I'm still waiting to hit that point. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
And just on the law school part, I was fortunate because actually even before I started law school, I was what's called a law clerk, which is very much like that apprenticeship while you're going to school. I law clerked for a firm that specialized in elder law and did probate. And then uh, I think my, my second year, I switched over to the firm where I stayed once I had finished law school and passed the bar, and that was litigation. We represented big banks. And one of the things was I found out I don't like elder law and I don't like probate law. I want more action. Um, and, and I thought the, the trial work was really fun. But it really helped me put into perspective what I was learning in the classroom. I had context for it. And then on the importance of law school, I think having a legal education makes life more interesting. Because when you're looking at an issue, you can see both sides of it. You can come up with those arguments. I live in Woodbridge, which is close to Sacramento. We have this basketball team called the Sacramento Kings, and we would really like to keep them. <laughs> but <laughs> Anaheim would like to have them. And I love reading the articles. There's so much involved. You have the financing issue and the Maloof's deal with the city, or actually the, pr the prior owners, and if they leave, this loan comes up, or it doesn't. You have um, the issue with, well, should the people of Anaheim be able to vote on these bonds? Um, and you just, you have your entertainment law. I mean, you've got everything going. So I don't care. You like fashion? Well, purses, knockoffs, patent law. So it just is fun to read the paper, and it's, it's fun to have conversations, and it's just made my life a lot richer. Um, let's talk a bit about economics. Um, uh, law school is expensive, um, and it's getting a whole lot more expensive. It, uh, it used to be, uh, private law schools were always expensive, but uh, it used to be that at the University of California, um, one could get a great legal education for dramatically less money uh, than in comparable uh, private schools. Uh, those days are over. Um, the uh, state of California has been in a profound and recurring budget crisis uh, for 15 or 20 years now, um, reaching a real crescendo this year. Um, one thing that's happened is over the last 20 years, the University of California has been consistently raising fees. Um, and they, they try to take about one third of each fee increase and put it back into financial aid. Uh, so in effect, the increased fees are a form of progressive income tax. But uh, nevertheless, that number is getting awfully high. And then just in the last two or three years, UC has taken the dramatic step of saying, well, we have certain professional schools um, such as law and medicine where people go into high earning careers and why shouldn't we put market pricing on those schools so uh, you know why shouldn't we price Berkeley the same way Stanford is priced um, and so that's been happening so there's there's no more good deal uh, there may be in a few other states but not in California anymore so, but, but there is a profound ability to borrow and, yeah. and, and that's yeah. what, I mean, that's right. <laughs> there's a good and a bad aspect of it. Yeah. If you want to go to law school, it can be financed. I mean, it is possible. The money's there, but you very possibly are going to be put in the situation of borrowing it. Three years of law school times a lot of borrowing each year, it is not unusual for people to graduate from law school with a very big burden of mm -hmm. debt and right now, we're discovering this last year that law school graduates were graduating into one of the worst job markets ever. And it's nice to say you want to do public interest law or this, that, or the other thing, but it's possible to run up the debt so much that it's going to affect your career choices. And for some people, they're really just having trouble finding jobs. So it, yeah. it, it can really be tough. Yeah. So one implication of that is... Um, unless you are fortunate enough to come from a wealthy family, um, one should consider the economics of graduate and professional school choices you make. And I would not, given the price of law school, I wouldn't advise anyone to go there just as a placeholder, saying, well, I don't really know what I want to do. It's a useful thing. Law gives you insights into a whole lot of different things. It does, in fact, as you've heard, give you insights into a whole lot of stuff. Um, but it's not it, a three-year vacation. It, it, can be a, it can be a very high price tag. So 
um, <laughs> it's, it's desirable to be focused and know what you want to do. And I think the only thing that I would add to that, and I, I did teach at McGeorge, and I dealt with first year law students and a whole bunch of them. And what I would hate to see any of you do is get yourself in a box. I have a daughter who graduated from Cal State Monterey Bay. She works for nonprofit and she's worked for a couple and I know what she makes. And if she were trying to pay off law school loans on top of that, that'd be very difficult. And so you don't want that pressure Law school is difficult enough. You don't want that added pressure of, you know, you can see the, the rate of how much you owe going up, 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 up. And you don't want to put yourself in a box so that you have to do something that you don't really want to do. Or I thought you made that great comment about if you're going to do it, then know it. You know, maybe you want to work for a nonprofit ultimately, but for three years you're going to have to be in the big firm so you can pay off those law school loans. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say, though, it is a big economic decision to decide to become a lawyer and there is an element of financial uncertainty in doing that. It can work out great. You can hear about the large salaries that everyone's supposed to make at big firms and such. It's often somebody stays at a big firm two, three years into it, they may decide to lay off your entire class. But they're big and uncertain economic elements. Think about that before making the decision. It also could work out very well economically for people, too. Mm -hmm. uh, when should you go to law school, in your opinion? Should you go to law school straight out of undergraduate? Should you take a year off and then go to law school? That is the perfect segue. Thank you yes. so, <laughs> so much. And actually, I'd like to start on that. I'm the poster child for deferring law school. I didn't start law school until I was 31. Um, I took that German degree and uh, taught, taught high school. And uh, I also had, I ran a business for a while, and then I went into law school. And so I brought with me all those experiences and that I had that discipline. I had been working for a while. I knew what it was like, and I was ready for the, for the workload. Again, going back to my students, I don't think it's a bad thing at all to go straight from your undergrad to law school. I've seen people be really successful. But if you're thinking, hey, I want to work for a couple years, um, that, is, that can be a good thing. It can help you maybe economically. You know, we were just talking about that. You can build up some savings for law school. And in my experience, often my students who had been doing something else for a couple years or longer really brought, they just, they just kind of had more experiences and, I, and they would bring it to school. And that was really helpful to them. Uh, I totally agree with that. Um, one also builds up maturity and focus while working. Um, I went straight from college to law school. I was 24 years old when I started law school. Excuse me, 20, 21 when I started law school, 24 when I finished. Um, some of my classmates had worked for two or three years. Others of my classmates had PhDs and had taught for half a dozen years and were in their early 30s. Um, they weren't any smarter than I was, but I noticed immediately that the people who'd been working for a few years or people who had advanced degrees and had been professors in other subjects were just dramatically better in their study habits and their focus. Um, and then once I started working, uh, I experienced that myself. I mean, as you, as you start working, you, you, know, you think you're pretty good in college and you think you're pretty good in law school and then you start working and you get a whole lot better and you get a whole lot better uh, in, in terms of focus and work habits and ability to put the pedal to the metal and deliver a product. Um, so any significant job that you pursue between college and law school will give you a leg up on maturity and focus. Yeah, I, I guess I would say, I mean, it's a very personal decision, but I think it is possible, I think it's very possible to defer going to law school up until the point that you're about 40. It, I mean, it, it, it's, I guess it's theoretically possible after that, but I mean, I found in my class there, there were some people who were 40 years of age. They were out, I mean, they were great. <laughs> they did very well. They had very rewarding legal careers. 
after age 40, it becomes a little bit more difficult because, I mean, you're really deep in a, a profession or, or some type of job, but it, it's very practical to say, look, I'm going to defer it a year or two. It's practical to say, I'm going to defer it five years. It's practical to say, I'm going to defer it 10 years. And it's even possible to defer it 20 years. So you've got a lot of possibilities there. There's it, one. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, the problem with deferring a long time is to be blunt. Um, law, law is, in general, a, a pretty fair-minded, non-discriminatory profession. Um, it's really clear who can do it and who can't, and employers don't care whether you're male, female, white, black, whatever. They want quality, and there aren't that many good lawyers. The big exception is there's really a lot of age discrimination. It's subtle, but... Uh, I would not recommend someone going on the job market as a lawyer for the first time in their early 40s. Early to mid-30s, fine. After 40, you, there's subtle age discrimination out there. The other place that the age discrimination occurs is as you get into your late 50s and early 60s, employers are looking for people who produce a lot of revenue. And if you're not a rainmaker and not a revenue producer, all of a sudden, Firms are not looking to have you retire with a gold watch at age 65. They're looking to push you out the door at 58 or 60. So notwithstanding what the Age Discrimination and Employment Act might say, uh, be warned <laughs> that uh, after, after age 40, it gets to be a cruel world out there. Yeah, and, and sometimes there are different opportunities available. Uh, the, the large firm practice hasn't been real good about attracting attorneys over 40. I mean, well, that's honestly, but, you know, sometimes government practice, other things like that. And I'm yeah. going to get to your question, but there was oh, one thing I wanted to say. What nice thing, though, about when I started practicing, I was, I was 35 then, and I was doing trial work, and everybody thought I'd been practicing law for like 10 years. <laughs> and so my job was not to say or write anything that would prove otherwise, <laughs> you know? And in my mind, I, I was like, oldest rookie ever. <laughs> what did you want to ask? Just, um, just going off this question, um, after undergraduate career, what are some good like, career choices for a couple of years or a year or two before law school? Can I, 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 and actually, I'm, glad you, I'm really glad you asked that because you saw that I have a German degree, which is probably not what you're thinking is what you're going to pop into law school with. My students that came, who came to me, I had students who had been in journalism and been working in newspapers uh, or other types of publications. I had students with every undergrad possible. And when I was telling you what I did yesterday, I would have loved to have had environmental knowledge. Um, I would have loved to have had a financing background. I would have loved to have had a psych, uh, psychology background. I often would love to have that one. <laughs> um, and so I, I think, and, and business, of course, too. What do you what do you like? Yeah, doing? I think. But well, like things that pop out to me: intellectual property, like business, corporate mm -hmm. law. I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I haven't made that decision. I've narrowed it down to two, three things. Where you know, I'd love to go get my MBA, maybe get a joint degree. But the thing is, like, I, if I haven't made that choice, what's a good decision for a couple of years to have a well-rounded, like, background to be able to go into something that? you like doing? Right. No, but seriously, something you like doing. Yeah. I mean, practically, if we looked at the possibilities of, of, of areas of work, you could use mm -hmm. just about any of these to help you in a legal career, as long as you enjoy it. Yeah. What I, what I look for when I'm hiring new attorneys, I don't look for any specific subject area. I, I look only for one thing. Focus, commitment, and sustained achievement. That's what I look for. I don't care what subject it is. It's pretty common to see people who do political science or economics or history go to law school. But if you did art history, if you did physics, if you did math, if you did agroecology, doesn't matter what it is. If you're good at it, if you've given it your heart and soul, sustained commitment, a lot of sweat equity, and then high achievement in whatever you choose to do, that's what matters. So let's just say, like, I'm interested in, like, Netflix, you know, like, the company. I go to Netflix, what do I ask for? Like, okay, like, I'm, I'm interested in business, like, what can I do there? Like, or I go into a law firm, like, being a law clerk or being, like, a, a legal assistant, like, is, 
appealing? Like, what, what, what are some good options that will prepare me? Like, it, like I'm going out for a career choice right now. What do I do? <coughs> like, just go into Netflix and be like, I don't know. I have no idea. Like, I'm just random I just, I don't know. <coughs> What's a good... Well, those are a couple of good examples. Um, a cousin of mine actually is a lawyer at Netflix, and they're, 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 they're doing quite <laughs> well. Talk, talk, talk to, to him, him after the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in the entertainment world, the entertainment world is interesting, uh, and the and the startup internet world is interesting because they're much less hierarchical than most other professions or industries. And it's really possible for people to get in on the ground floor and then go places just based on raw ability. Uh, it's always been that way in entertainment, and it still is. Uh, the the other thing to do that that's, that you mentioned is be a legal assistant. Um, you, sometimes you can get those jobs straight out of college. Sometimes um, companies or law firms like to see you to go to a paralegal training course. There's a lot of three month courses offered. Uh, UC, UCLA Extension as one, um, and, and actually working in some kind of legal environment and particularly sampling different species, subspecies within the legal profession to see what feels right for you. If you came to our winery, for example, here are some things that maybe you could do. Maybe you like graphic arts, so you want to do that. And as you're doing the graphic arts, you're going to learn about patent law. And that's a great design that you made, but you know what? It's too close to somebody else's, and we're going to get in big trouble for using it. Um, if you're interested in economics and that business aspect of it, you could help us with budget issues. Um, you could help us with just documenting uh, our sales. Where are we not taking full advantage of what we should be doing? If you're interested maybe in, in wine, to having wine sales to different states, it's really complex. And so that would be something like on the compliance side that you could do. So I go back to what both of you had said, what do you love doing? And I think, you know, in a lot of places you can do it and explore it. And you can go in, you can say, you know, I'm, I'm here and I'm looking towards possibly going to law school. You know, and to me, that would be really appealing because you would be somebody who would be growing up with us. And I, you know, I'd really like that. Who knows? They might help you with your law school financing. Mm -hmm. There's a question back here. Uh, I was just wondering, um, those of us who don't come from the great economic backgrounds, as referring back to law school, I was wondering if we had the reality of it, all of the end of it all, like, are we going to have that same commodity for law school? If law school is just going to be getting more expensive and expensive. Mm. So you're, you're saying that, you know, as you're saving money, the amount that you're saving, it's going to be that much higher? You know, one thing, too, and I'll, I'll tell you that now going back as a law instructor, there are a lot of opportunities for scholarships, you know, and so just beat the door on those. We, I, so many of our students had some type of financial aid, and I don't think we've talked about that. So there is that help, so I don't want to scare you, scare you off. It depends what you think that you want to, what you want to do, too. Uh, all the major law schools have good financial aid programs. If you can get in, they will put together a financial aid package to where you can get through. Mm -hmm. um, but it so often includes significant borrowing. Right. It could, but we yeah. also, I know like at, at my law school, we had alums who had set up scholarships specifically for people who wanted to do like legal aid, nonprofit work. And you would commit to, I'm going to do that for three years or five years after I graduate. And it was that the money that you would get either would totally pay for your fees or really help you. So you have to really look at, you know, really look at the financing. But I think that you're right. And that's the thing that I think is most troubling right now is the economics of it and going back to not wanting to see you get into a box. Yes, we have a question in the back. I, I think that what one can look forward to is, um, to me, I'd say a lot of fun, a lot of work. Um, I remember people telling me law school was going to be hard, and nothing, I'd heard that before and it wasn't really hard. It was hard. And a lot of it's just the sheer volume of work. But I think it's so exciting. You can look forward to what I used to teach, that legal research and analysis and writing. And that's exciting because you really are honing your, your brains and your thinking. And you're learning kind of a new way of thinking. Uh, usually you've got contracts. 
and you've got torts, um, what, civil procedure, maybe, maybe criminal law, what you can look forward to is really being intellectually stimulated not only by your professors, but everybody who is around you. It's, it's very exciting. It's a really good buzz. But I don't want to underestimate what, how hard the work is. It's, it's also intellectual stimulation in a particular way. That is, um, legal reasoning, as is done in the Anglo-American legal system, has a particular intellectual construct. And that's fundamentally what law schools teach. Uh, they teach you, it's, it's like being a carpenter, they teach you how to use the tools. Mm -hmm. And once you know how to use the tools, you can build any different kind of building. But the first year of law school, they're absolutely giving you total immersion in a particular intellectual mindset. Yeah, I, I, I think to be fair, and, and this is pretty common experience, first year and even after the first year, it is very much directed towards dissecting, re first reading before class, and in class di presenting and dissecting appellate cases in whichever field the, the, the class is devoted to. It's very intensive case analysis in the first year, yeah. and often after that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. The, the LSAT is shaped to replicate insofar as you can replicate in a test the particular kind of subset of intellectual construct that is, um, that is what law school does. It is not a perfect predictor. A uh, high LSAT score doesn't mean you're going to be a great lawyer, and conversely, a low LSAT score doesn't mean that you can't be a great lawyer. Um, but there, it, within my experience, there's a reasonable correlation between people whose brain shape clicks with the LSAT to where if you're going to click with the particular shape, intellectual shape of law school. Gentleman in the back. So you started your own practice after NYU? No, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I have worked with two law firms. The first was a Los Angeles, principally entertainment-based firm, and I'm currently with a firm that I think we have about somewhere around 300, 350 lawyers based in Los Angeles and in New York. So I've only worked with reasonably large okay. law firms. Never practiced by myself. Um, what do you guys know about starting your own You know, what, what I know about it is, and, and I'm a member of the Cal, uh, California State Bar, the Agribusiness Committee, they have, and you can actually, they, they've got something going too while you're in law school, but there is a whole section for solo practitioners and for young lawyers, and I think they mean that you've only had a few, pra you know, a year or two of practice, I think even though I, I think I would have qualified for that, even given my age. So you can have, a, there's a lot of help with that. You can get a lot of help with that. I, I'm maybe the only one who's practicing on my own, but I so, I'm in such a kind of unique situation, I, I sort of don't count. And, and I feel like if my family wants to fire me, you just go for it, you know? <laughs> but um, there's a lot of help out there for it. And with all like the Facebook, um, I see a lot of solo practitioners working with each other. That I think is, obviously there's the economic side of it, but what I think is hard is especially when you're new and honestly you don't know, you haven't done anything before, you can't go to you know, people with great experience and say help, but you can in the sense that you have all these other resources and that's the most difficult thing. So, And you talk to me afterwards because you can maybe go on the bar right now and, and the, go and law students or I'll, I'll talk to somebody and see if you can kind of see get some, some help for you on that so you could get an idea of what that would be like. I, I think it's fair to say you have to be a real self-starter. Yeah. You have to have a lot of confidence in yourself, and you have to have a tremendous ability to work independently. It is difficult, I believe, to go to three years of law school, and once you've taken the bar, 
establish your own firm. It can be done. Some people do it yeah. successfully, but it's, it, it's a difficult thing to do. More typical is to join a firm of some size. It can be enormous. It can be just a couple people. Work with people who actually know what it's like to be a lawyer for a while, and then in a couple of years decide, particularly when you've developed some relationships with some people who might want to pay you for your work, then go out on your own. And that segues us to a next topic that we have, and I think maybe we want to combine two concepts here in our last few minutes. Um, one is uh, the realities of stress and tr stress and strain uh, in practicing law, um, and the other uh, is an admonition we have that if you're thinking about going to law school, it's a really good idea to talk to as many attorneys as you can. Um, and if, if you don't know attorneys through your immediate family environment, like I didn't uh, at all, uh, I was first generation in my family to go to college, didn't know attorneys, so I kind of just blundered along through law school and wound up doing fine. But to the extent that you can network with people and talk to attorneys, um, don't be bashful. Uh, people will be happy to tell you what their lives are like. And to the extent that you can sample that as broadly as you can, uh, it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that we were going to talk about is is the, the stress and strain. And we've kind of talked about it all the way through. Um, when I started practicing, I was doing litigation, which was really fun and I loved. But I had two young children, one who is a student here, and my husband was traveling all the time. And so it, it just became very difficult. And I'd always wanted to teach at McGeorge, and the opportunity came up for me. And so I did make the switch. I think the other thing, too, is you want to find a place that's a good fit for you. So like I knew, I didn't want to do elder law, not a good fit. And it could be a not a good fit for you either because of the type of law or the culture so uh, of the law firm. And, and they can be great people, but they're not your people. So you've got to find that place where you're, where you're happy. But definitely, and it's not just trial work. Um, I do contracts and that type of thing, and sometimes I think those people are more demanding. <laughs> you know, I thought, oh, I can't wait to get out of these deadlines. So, I, I, yeah, I, I guess I have a, a little bit different view on the stress and the strain. Uh, the first thing, I, and, and by the way, I, I just I have loved my practice. It has been a wonderful practice, but at the same time, it's come at a cost. First thing is the hours can be unbelievably long. Uh, many years it's been like being a resident in medicine. This is true for some people, isn't so true for others, but it certainly is possible to have very, very tough hours. Uh, travel can be very tough, often travel on very short notice. After you've lived in a hotel room for three months, I don't care how nice the hotel is, it's not so nice. Uh, <laughs> it is possible for law to just prove absolutely hell on your family relationships. I think that practically every lawyer's relationship with their kids and their families has been affected by the fact that they are practicing law. And unfortunately, it's also possible, well, I have found most lawyers are wonderful people. Many of my best friends are lawyers. Some of the most miserable SOBs in the world are also lawyers, and they can make the job much less fun. Uh, so also be ready for that. Yeah. But you, you could say that about any profession. That's I right. mean, there's there's uh, there's doctors and physicists and so forth who are. I think there there's a greater the percentage in law. But <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of a magnet. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I would actually. Um, I would actually differ with Terry on that last point. I mean, it's you. You can, of course, never go wrong. Making, All these warm and cuddly litigators. Yeah, you I know. Can, <laughs> you, you can never go wrong making self-deprecating lawyer jokes. And if you become a lawyer, you you want to have a vast repertoire of self-deprecating lawyer jokes to tell at parties. But that said, uh, I've actually had the experience working in some um, hard-driving big firms where they really felt like family, where they were very, very close. There were, yes, yes, there were long hours, yes, there was strain, but there were also very close personal relationships, very close family relationships. Were they on the other uh, side of litigation? 
No, 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 no. <laughs> That's the point. Uh, Sometimes the people on the other side aren't as Oh, no, no, as actually, uh, no, oh, I, I see what you mean. No, actually, yeah. um, I'm, I'm good friends with a lot of my opposing counsel. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for it. Um, one is that law aside, you know, you should just go through life trying to be a good person, trying to be nice to people. And if you are, you'll be surprised at how many people are nice back to you. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the sort of human capital of the world goes up that way. So for any profession, that's a good idea. And you'll be surprised at how many people reciprocate. And the other is that the, uh, the TV stereotype of the eats rusty nails for breakfast lawyer kind of thing, that is rarely in your client's interest. It is almost always in your client's interest for you to be a reasonable, moderate, straight shooting person who, who you, you know, you, you're straightforward, you make agreements and make compromises where they're appropriate, you stand your ground and disagree and fight about things where it's appropriate, um, but you can be surprised at how many times um, you can be good friends. I'm, I'm good friends with a lot of my opposing counsel. And then others, we may not be buddies, but we are at least cordial and professionally respectful. And I think that's, uh, it's not only a better way to lead your life, it's good for your client. Faye, yes. Yeah. Yep, you're married to this person now, but in 20 years you might wish them dead. You know, that kind of thing. Yes, you're business partners with this person now, but in one year you may not want to be business partners with them. I, I, I'm in the business as an educator. I'm in the business of saying, hey, you're getting a C now, but you can get an A. <laughs> you know, life could get better. And you're sort of trained, it seems to me, to be thinking about how everything could go wrong. How do you, um, now I have friends who are oncologists also, so how do you uh, prevent yourself from getting a kind of a stress or a wear and tear or a diminishment of your sunny uh, humanity by always, even though you have to always think about how things could go wrong? Because you've asked the right question, but your question only is talking about one side of the coin. One side of the coin is, in any discipline, whether it's Terry's tax deal or Donna's corporate deal or my litigation advice to a client, one side of the coin uh, absolutely is figuring out what are the rules, how can my client mess up, how do I advise the client not to mess up. The other side of the coin is the positive proactive side, which is whether it's in litigation or in a corporate deal, how do you make things go right? How do you advise your client? And how do you work with and negotiate with opposing parties for a win-win? And that's a whole lot of what lawyers do. And it's very satisfying. And I would also say I go to the winery. <laughs> There's a room in there with all the different bottles and this old oak table, and it's just a happy place to be. <laughs> On that note, I want to thank all of you for coming and invite you to thank our Presenters Donna, Paul, and Terry. Ford.